Alright, so let's go ahead and get started with this class. So we are going to have a homework assignment today, okay, you know, um, because I think we can get put enough material to get the homework assignment assigned. Okay? <clears throat> Alright. So we'll take a look at what we have today. So today the main thing we have to do is I will talk about the homework assignment first and then you guys can uh, and then we'll talk about the concepts that you need in order to do the homework assignment. We got most of it already, okay? We don't have everything, but we got most of it already. So the assignment is called, um, it's in the control unit side, and the assignment itself is called Music Box. And I'm gonna change a few things because I think the due date or the time of the due date is definitely not right. So let me go fix that first. So I'll give you guys a week to work on this one. I don't think, you know, once you understand what you need to do, you don't need an entire week. And so, here we have to get to this month. And today is the 9th, so that will be the 16th. It's going to be due on the 16th, um, right when the class starts. So 1900. There we go. So that's going to be the due date. And I'm going to change grade here and get away. Oh, it's still in direct. Simple direct grading. Okay, so we can do that. Save and display. There we go. So the assignment is now active. So what we'll do is we'll take a quick look at the assignment itself, the description of the homework assignment, and then we'll take a look at one of the components that you really need to use in order to make this work. Okay. So the music, music box is the most basic form of automation um, because, you know, instead of plucking pins to make a sound, a music box in this homework assignment will display zero and zeros and ones in a bank of output <coughs> pins. So instead of plucking pins, that's what it's going to do. So just to make sure that culturally, you know, I'm not missing anyone because, you know, music box is not a universal device. So I'm going to display a music box so that everybody know what I'm talking about. So we'll take a look at images of music boxes and particularly the mechanism of one. This is a pretty good mechanism right there. And I'm going to check whether the speaker is connected or not because this is actually a YouTube clip. So I'm not, I want to see if I can play it in class. And it's not hooked up correctly. So let me see if I can change the output device. Okay, built in. Okay. Let's see, the computer output is here. It is connected. There's no sound coming out of it. <coughs> hmm. Well. Okay, let me let me just kind of magnify this, and oh, but it doesn't rotate. Doesn't actually animate. Oh, that's useless. <laughs> All right, so let's look at another one. Hopefully, there's another one that actually has a has a moving component. Yeah, I guess so. Okay, there we go. <laughs> what? If you just type R three music box, huh? R three, R three. But all of those do not have animation of the music box itself. I want the animation of the music box itself. Type in mechanism after. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. How does it work? There we go. Okay, this is actually a pretty good one. You know, if you, um, I actually watched this one. This. Uh, the, 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 the people who are explaining are actually British, so there's a very strong British accent to uh, this particular show. But I can't you know, get the speaker to work, unfortunately. So we'll skip to the portion where, okay, so he's, he's showing how you can pluck a wire and make a sound, and how the table you know, is used as a soundboard to amplify the, the sound itself. And then he's now showing how you can use, um, I 
think these are song um, bands, okay, of their of the blades of the you know, song that he's using. Uh, his, then he will change the length of each one so he can play different notes on these days. Okay, which is not automation, so it's not it's interesting, but not related to what we are doing. So now he's taking you know the the harp or the uh, the. Um, the actual part out of the music box, and he's, he's using a toothpick to actuate those individual wires. So he's playing a tune using a toothpick, you know, in, in that particular case. And now he's putting it back into <coughs> the music box mechanism. And this is the part that where I need to pause, okay? You know, because what's happening here is we have a drum, and on the drum there are these little pegs that are sticking out. And as the drum rotates, okay, because the whole thing is wound up, as the drum rotates, these little pegs will pluck the uh, the harp like thing, and depending on which thing it plucks, it will make a different sound. And this is how a music box you know, plays music. Is is that okay? Okay. So most of you probably have seen the music box before, but because this is the digital, this is the information era, okay. Most of us, you know, have heard of the music box, have watched the music box on YouTube, but have never seen one, you know, actual in, you know, in actuality. But those days are coming because it's going to be more expensive to make a mechanical <coughs> music box than to have one that is electronic. I think that those days are here already because to mechanically make one, you, there's a lot of manual labor involved. Okay, you have, there are parts that you have to put together that robots cannot really do very proficiently. But in electronics, you're just manufacturing chips, right? Chips are just printed. It's like, it's easy to mass produce. They're very easy to put onto a circuit board. It's all fully automated. And you know, just attach a battery to it, and you're done. Mechanical devices are very expensive to put together. Even if the material is inexpensive, the labor to put it together is expensive. Okay, so I will, there will come a day, you know, five years from now, that I can use this particular video, and then nobody in class knows what it is about. It's like, what is that? <clears throat> but this is important, okay? Because what we're trying to do is to do the same kind of thing, because we want to actuate individual pins of our registers, the, the ALU and stuff like that. We want to pluck, what are we plucking? We're plucking the enable input of a register. We are plucking the clock, okay? We are plucking, you know, all of those things. If we are trying to orchestrate how the components inside the processor will work with each other, the timing of that. Is that okay? Or, or are, we, are we getting a rough idea of why this is relevant to our <coughs> class? Okay, all right. So this is a music box. So the question is, how do we simulate the a music box? There are two main components to a music box. One component is the component that is responsible to make it turn, okay? Because if it doesn't turn, there's no music. So that's the first component. How do we make it turn? And we have just the answer for that too, okay? We can combine an adder and a register to get it done. Because what, what does an adder do? It's called an adder because it adds. Right, very good, okay. So an adder adds, okay, but by itself, it cannot be a mechanism to do something like that. Because a red, because an adder will simulta almost simultaneously come up with the sum of the two inputs, okay? What about the next one? You cannot put it back you know, easily just using an adder, okay? So what about a register? A register is a memory device, right? Okay, we talked about you know, a um, edge-sensitive gated D flip-flop last time. Okay, you guys still remember that? So the idea is it is a memory device, okay? You can give it a D as an input to specify the new state, but it's not gonna change the state unless the register is first enabled and two, we have a rising edge at the clock signal. Then it will update its content, and then the content is immediately output. You know, it will serve as the output of the register immediately. Okay, so that's a register. So a register by itself, obviously, cannot be a mechanism like that. It cannot turn anything because you know it can only be used to remember something. 
But when you combine an adder and a register, then you're talking about some mechanism that can actually be used as a as a as a ticking mechanism. Okay, and you can use the clock to turn quote unquote uh, provide the basic energy to turn the drum. Okay? So in Logisim, you can use a clock to automate stuff. So let's go ahead and take a look at Logisim and see what we can do inside Logisim as far as the clock is concerned. So we'll go ahead and say Java. Okay. So in Logisim, there is a clock signal under in wiring. And a clock looks just like an input pin, but it's not an input pin. Okay? It looks slightly different. Instead of having a bubble in the inside, it has a kind of like a um, like edges, you know, over here. And by itself, you can also always do some simulation already because what we can do is we can go to simulate, and we can we can take the clock, you know, using the keyboard by using Control T for each click. So I will just go ahead and press Control T right now. Do you see how the um, the icon changes? And also, it is now light green because it is now outputting a signal of one. If I click, if I press Control T again, it is now back to the dark green, which is a zero. So you can use Control T to to basically alternate the state between the zero and the one for clock line, okay? Which is not very convenient when it is time for you to automate your design. You can go to simulate, and then you you click uh, ticks enabled, and you can also select a tick frequency first. You know, just to just so that it, it is low enough for you to see at two kilohertz we cannot see a single thing. So we'll go ahead and lower the uh, tick frequency to something that is observable. Uh, one hertz is probably kind of slow, but it is definitely observable. So once you change the frequency to one hertz, which means one transition per second, you go to simulate and then you say tick enabled, which is also control K. Now you can just walk away because your clock is now you know, it just ticks by itself. Okay? And the frequency. Okay, so right now I have a frequency of one second. Now, if you crank the frequency to two kilohertz, you can't really see it transitioning because your eyes can only detect um, up to what twenty-two ish frames per second. So that means anything faster than twenty hertz to you is a blur, unless you are fly, because flies actually have a much higher refresh rate as far as their eyes are concerned. But that's how they can avoid you you know swiping them all the time. Because they see your hand coming in slow motion. They got plenty of time to fly away. And when you see fluorescent lights, you see it constantly on. And some people get, you know, kind of see the flicker, but very few people get bothered by the flicker. To a fly, it is on and then off. On and then off. Because the refresh rate of the of a fly's eye is so fast, you know what seems to be because of the persistence effect of uh, the neurons of, of your eye, we seem to see something that is continuously on. But because a fly has such a high refresh rate, you know it's all flickering. It's, it's not flickering; it's just on, off, on, off. It's blinking as far as a fly is concerned. Well, okay. None of you seem to be fascinated by that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, control K stops it. Okay, there we go. So we got the most basic component, which is a clock line. It, it provides the heartbeat to make everything work, okay? So the next component that you will need is going to be a register, okay? A register is a part of memory, and we just need this particular register here. Um, a register has a few um, options you can choose. Um, you can choose the database, okay? So for your homework assignment, you can choose the width of your register. By default, it is eight. You can always increase it or decrease it to what you need. Okay. Um, it uh, also has a register, has a trigger. I would just keep the rising edge trigger. You know, it's not going to be a problem. You can always uh, you know, use a label too. But since you will only need one register in your homework assignment, you know, it doesn't have to be labeled. Okay. And for this particular homework assignment, because our focus is no longer adding and subtracting, you can just go ahead <laughs> and go to arithmetic and pull an adder out of it. There you go. So now we have an adder. An adder has got several inputs and only two outputs. The inputs would involve the, the two numbers that you're adding, the carry in, the carry out, which is probably not very useful for your homework assignment, 
and also the number that is the output, the sum of the two numbers. Okay? So if you hover over these individual pins, it will show you what it is. This is the first number that you're adding. This is the second number that you're adding. This is carry in, this is carry out, and this is the sum. All of the inputs must be connected to something, so do not leave any input pins unconnected. The output pins, on the other hand, if it's something is not useful to you, leave it unconnected, no problem. Okay? So now we have the three major components to kind of create the, the heartbeat, so to speak, okay, to make the, the drum rotate. Okay? But it doesn't make any music because hey, there's, there's, there's nothing that is playing, okay? It's not, it's not you're plucking any wire, right? So you need to make that wire as well. So the wire that we are gonna use is a ROM. It is also under memory, and it is a ROM which stands for read-only memory. Okay, very good. So in, as a read-only memory, you cannot change the content. There's no way you can write content to a ROM. You can only get content out of it, okay? So when you look at ROM, there are several ways to look at a ROM in Logisim. You can right-click on it and select Edit Contents. And in this particular view, a ROM is nothing more than a gigantic array of bytes. Okay? Now you can change that too. You know, the, each individual location of a ROM, now the default is only 8 bit wide. It doesn't have to be 8 bit wide. Okay? If you say, oh, you know what, for this homework assignment, I think 7 bits is more appropriate, change the width to 7 bits. If you think 11 bits, okay, any, any, any integer, any non-negative number is good. Okay? If you think 11 bits is good, change the width of each location to 11 bits. So you are free to change the width of your ROM. Okay? The output of the ROM can be of any bit width that you require. And to change that, okay, let me save this first. To change that, you sim simply select the ROM module, and then you change the, 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 add, you change the data bit width. So you can, you can select something that's kind of oddball, like 11 bits, hey, no problem. But you can also see that when you select 11, the representation of these numbers has changed. <laughs> because when what you see here, and also what you see in the uh, hex, hexadecimal editor, guess what, guess what base it is in? It's called a hex editor for a reason. It is hexadecimal, okay? What is hexadecimal? What is hexa? It means six. What is deci? 10. So when you have hexa deci, it means 16, base 16. Well, yet another base that we have to deal with in computer science. Some of you may think, well, only in your class tech. No, no, I, I beg to differ, okay? You know, base 16 is a very useful base. The reason why it is useful is because <laughs> I like binary numbers, okay? Because binary numbers make addition, subtraction, and all of those arithmetic operations very easy to perform. Everything can be done by logic gates. I like binary numbers. But there's one minor problem with binary numbers. To represent a value, you would need a lot of digits. Because from zero to 15 as unsigned values, you need four bits. From zero to about a thousand, you need ten bits, ten digits to represent you know, zero to ten, uh, one thousand twenty-three in decimal. Okay, so you can kind of imagine how many binary digits will need to represent the national deficit. <laughs> how much is the uh, how, how much is the national deficit at this point? Well, we can we can look it up. I think there's a live you know, yeah something some trillions right. So we. Can, we can kind of guesstimate you know, how many binary digits we, we, we have to use. So, <clears throat> and I think there's a, okay, the US, okay, this is, doo -doo -doo -doo. okay, let's just say it's 441 billion. I think it was a little more than that, but apparently not. What? <laughs> the end of the paragraph is the current one. The current one? 3.63 is, no, no, that's the revenue. The difference is our, is our deficit. So, so the deficit is like 0.441, you know, trillion, okay? So it's, it's less than a trillion. How many binary digits do we need to represent, you know, half a billion? Half a trillion. 
Okay, there's a quick way to do it, okay? Now, the quickest way to do it is to pull out your calculator. You say uh, 441 billion log, okay? Remember that number, and then you say two log and divide those two numbers that will tell you the number of digits you need to represent you know, this value as a binary number. But there's a, quick, there's a quick way to do it. There's a rule of thumb to do stuff like that. So every three digits in, the, in base 10 is approximately 10 digits in binary because 1,000 is approximately 1024, which is two to the power of 10, okay? So you can kind of make a quick equivalence like that for guesstimating stuff. So that means 1,000 is 10 bits, 1 million is 20 bits, yes? So 1 billion is 30 bits, and then 1 trillion is 40 bits, <coughs> okay? And because this is half a trillion, so you take one bit away, you get 39 digits. So approximately 39 digits. You need 39 binary digits, 39 bits, to represent the national deficit in US dollars. Is that okay? That's a lot of numbers. That's a lot of digits to spell out, <laughs> right? And they're all what? Zeros and ones. <laughs> which makes it even worse. Okay, so that's the that's why you know binary numbers for many reasons is a very good base to use, but when it comes to practical use to represent actual values that are kind of big, it's really cumbersome. Not that they cannot do it, it's just very cumbersome. And this is why this is how hexadecimal numbers come in handy. Hexadecimals are very easy to work with, and the best way to look at this is to use a spreadsheet to look at it. Now, you don't have to do things that the way that I, that I do, <clears throat> but I find a spreadsheet very useful in cases like that. Okay, so I can even put this into the shared folder <coughs> so that you guys can actually have access to the document <laughs> once, it's, it's a, when it, once it is done. I'm going to put it into examples. Okay, so in, in the examples, which already has a lot of stuff, I'm going to make a new spreadsheet and I will call this spreadsheet. Um, hexadecimal. Okay, so that's a very easy name to remember. Hexadecimal. There we go. Okay, excellent. So what we'll do is we're going to look at the representation of values, base 10, base 2, and then base 16. Okay, so this is a conversion table for you guys to use. Um, the first one is going to be base 10 by default. Okay, so it's fairly easy to specify all the values. So this is a um, the previous cell plus one. And I only have to go up to 15 because with four bits, okay, we can only represent the, the decimal numbers from zero to 15. Because two to the power of four is 16, but zero is taking up one spot already. So that's why the largest value we can represent is actually 15. So the next column will use binary numbers. And in a spreadsheet, you can use bin to, oh, deck to bin, decimal to binary, to specify, you know, a binary number. So in this case, you know, the cell right next to it on the left-hand side specifies the value, and I want to force um, the spreadsheet to use exactly four digits to represent that particular value. So not really surprisingly, um, it goes from 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1. Any questions about this? Questions? Okay. So the next column is going to be in hexadecimal. Now in hexadecimal, we have a little bit of a problem because base 16 means each digit can represent the value of 0 all the way up to 15 as one single digit. But in base 10, we end at 9. Okay, 10 as a value requires two base 10 digits. So we don't have any actual uh, numeric symbol to represent the quantity 10 itself, because 10 requires one zero in base 10. So what we do in hexadecimal numbers is we borrow digits or borrow characters from the alphabet. So that A, lower, uh, uppercase or lowercase, it, it usually is case insensitive, but A is representing the value of 10, B is representing the value of 11, and so on, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at how that would look like. So we use deck to hex or hexadecimal. This is the value that I'm converting 
and we only want to use one single significant digit in this case. So we can now see that column C is representing all the hexadecimal digits corresponding to the actual value. Column A is base 10, column B is binary, column C is hexadecimal. Are we doing okay so far with this table here? Good, okay? The conversion between base 2 and base 16 does not involve division, does not involve multiplication, does not involve addition. It is just lookup. So what you do is you divide, you chop up the bits into chunks of four, but you have to start from the right hand side. Okay? If you have any leftover, okay, if the leftover is not exactly four digits, you pack zeros to the left hand side until you get all the digits that you need. <coughs> At that point, it really it really is just a matter of looking up the table. Okay? Look up all the four bit patterns and look up the hexadecimal representation for those four bits and write the number in hexadecimal. Let's give it a try. Okay, so we'll go ahead and give ourselves a little exercise here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so we'll go ahead and generate, you know, some numbers, okay? So we say uh, random, random between, okay? So we'll do some random numbers and we'll do some fairly large numbers. Let's say we go from 1,000 in base 10 to 20,000 in base 10. Okay, it doesn't really matter, okay? And we'll have a bunch of these. So we have a few examples to work on. And I'm not gonna bother to do the conversion in base 2 by hand, so I'm gonna use deck to bin. So I'll cheat a little bit here. So um, we'll do the conversion like that, but I do not specify the number of significant digits, which means which means that I am forced to have to pad all the zeros, you know, and stuff like that. So I can show you guys how to do it. Um, no kidding. <laughs> it cannot do with no larger numbers. <coughs> ah. Who would have thought? <laughs> okay, let's let's go from two fifty six to five eleven. I'm so disappointed. There we go. Okay. So now we got some numbers and and I want to go. I, I want to use some smaller numbers as well. So let's go pick from three. Okay. <coughs> There we go. So we got some varying width and stuff like that. So now I want to show you guys how to do the conversion. So when you do the conversion, what you do is you group the bits from right, which is least significant, to left, which is significant, more significant, into groups of four. So that means in the first one, okay, in this particular case, you look at 1011 as one chunk of four bits, and then you ask the question, what is 1011? So I'm going to use um, column, let's see, the largest value is only 512, so that means it is, everything can be done in three hexadecimal digits, so E is fine. So I'm going to use column E to represent the least significant four bits of a number. In this case, it's 1011. Can anyone remember what is the hexadecimal digit representing the binary bit pattern of 1011? It's not 11, it, because 11 is not, is not hexadecimal, it's B, yeah, B is correct, okay, so we, we have a B here, um, yeah, it keeps, because every time I make changes, it, it will fix, it will change all of the other ones, I can turn it off, you can go to the options of a file, okay, let me see if I can remember, document details, no, it's in tools, Protect sheet, no. There's one place I can disable the auto update thing. I just have to find out. Edits, no. Spreadsheet setting, there we go. So you can go to spreadsheet setting and go to calculation and then you do the ca uh, recalculation and you say, hmm, can we turn it off altogether? On change, iterative calculation. Okay. I guess I can, the, the best, I, and this is on change and every, oh, okay, there's no way to do it. 
Hmm? Yeah, I have to fix the values, but then I have to copy by hand. Hmm? No, it's going to copy the equation instead. So they will still be linked to the original number. Let me see if there's a way to copy just the value. So copy and go here and say paste, but only paste um, the value. Ah, there we go. Okay, excellent. So now we, 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 we lock down those things. <clears throat> yeah, there we go. Okay, so now we can work on this again. Okay, so once again, we have to look from um, right to left. So the rightmost four digit in column D, row one, is zero, one, zero, zero, which is four. Very good. Okay. So there's a four here. What about the next four digits? Which would be a zero, one, one, zero. It's a six. Very good. And what about the first one? Oh, it's a one all by itself, right? So if it's a one all by itself, you know, it doesn't match any four bit pattern. In the in sheet one, what do we do then? So Assuming that I don't know that one is really just one, right? Pat zeros to which side? To the left hand side. So we got zero 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 one, and using zero 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 one, I can look it up and go like, oh, okay, that is just one in hexadecimal. Now, of course, that is kind of silly because you know one is one in regardless of the base, but that's the procedure. That is the steps to do it. And you know, just so that it doesn't really uh, make us dizzy, I'm gonna hide these two. Okay, that way there's a way to hide it. Oh, I, th I think I can right click it and hide. Sorry? There we go. There we go. So now we won't get distracted by that. All right, so let's look at the second number. Uh, the last four digits are zero, 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 zero. Okay, that's easy to look up. It's just a zero. The next four would be one, one, zero, zero, which is, which is? Six. <coughs> nope. One, one, zero, zero. One, one, zero, zero. One, one, zero, zero is a C. Very good because it's a 12, okay? It's a 12, so it's a C. Okay, so we put a C here. It doesn't look good because it's justified in the wrong direction, but nonetheless, it is a C. Um, if I want it to look a little bit better, I can always shrink the columns, so it looks a little better. Um, okay, we, once again, we have a one left. Okay, that's an easy one because we just pad all the ones, all the zeros to the other side. It becomes one C zero. Uh, the next one, oh, this, this is too easy. Let's, let's make something that's hard, a little bit harder. Uh, what about 67, there we go, okay. So 67 is significantly smaller than the other number. So the least significant four bits are 0, 0, 1, 1, which is 3. OK, very good. And then the next group of four digits. Oh, we don't have four. We only, get, we only got 1, 0, 0. Pad a 0 to the left-hand side. So we got 0, 1, 0, 0, which is a 4. Oh, but we don't have any more digits. What do I do? Yep. So you can, just, you can always keep padding zeros, okay, to the left hand side. Okay, let's look up this one. One one zero one is well, we yeah exactly because we know the other one is a C, so this one is a D. Uh, the next four digits will be one 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 one, which is F, and then we just pad all the zeros. Okay, very good. Um, does anyone see any car keys around you or on the floor? <laughs> I guess not. Um, so if you, um, you can go to the computer lab and see if somebody else has picked it up, and they usually return it to the computer lab. Yeah. Room one fifty two. This is why I have a tile. <laughs> Do you guys know what is a tile? Yeah, yeah because it, it actually goes both ways. Um, if I, my phone, you know, answers it. 
And I can do it the other way. My phone can page you know, the tile as well. If I have 20 tiles, my phone can page any one of the 20 tiles. If I don't know where the tile is, the phone will actually give me a map of where the phone last had contact with that tile. Okay? Wow. And then if I declare the tile lost, then the phone will phone you know will, will call up Mothership, you know, the tile company. And then the tile company will send out a, you know, um, how do they call those, a wanted, you know, thing to all, every single cell phone with a tile app installed and say, help look for this particular tile. So now I have thousands of people helping me to find my tile. Because if any one of those people find it, they will contact Mothership, Mothership will contact me and go, oh, somebody just found your tile, it is located here. So it's time to call the police. <laughs> 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 to, to accompany me to that location, yes. So that's what a tile is, and it's, it's tremendously useful. It's kind of expensive, but depending on what you put your tile into, you know, like a hmm? $25. $25 for one. But if you buy multiple, I think it's less expensive. Yep, and they have different sizes too. Yep. Does someone like that have like a battery that you get to recharge? or? Nope. Um, this, the way they do this is uh, when when a tile runs out of battery, um, you just order because the, the app actually monitors the battery condition of the tiles. So when one is about to run out, it will actually tell you it's time to reorder. So you just press a button and it will reorder and then the next day you get your new tiles. And then they come with a package where you can send the old tiles back so they can recycle the old tiles you know, correctly and not just throw into the uh, landfill. So are you re rebuying them? Time they go it's down. also half right. price. Okay. Yep. You get it the second time, it's half price. Oh, second time is half price. Oh, yeah. Yes. Sorry? Waterproof? Waterproof? I don't know whether it is truly waterproof or not. Haven't tried that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have played it with the music box video. The music box video with this? Yeah. Sounds just like that. Oh, this is a lot better than Music Box. <laughs> it sounds a lot better than the Music Box, but it is it's truly amazing to me. You know, it's yeah. not the device itself that is you know innovative. It is the surface. It's how they connect the device to Bluetooth and then to the to the cloud. <laughs> that is what makes the tile different from all of the other located devices that we have seen, you know, up to this point. <clears throat> All right, so back to here. So we got a one for the least significant four digits. And then the next four are 0101, zero, one, zero, one, which is a five. And then we got one as a leftover. So we got 0001, zero, zero, one, which is just a one. So are we OK with this process of how we break down the bits into groups of four, but you have to do it from right to left? Is that cool? OK. Because this is what you need to do to make use of the ROM in your homework assignment. So that's why it is directly related to your homework assignment. <clears throat> because the ROM editor can only take on hexadecimal numbers. So you have to represent everything in hexadecimal. Which probably means you have to convert everything into binary first and then back to <coughs> hexadecimal. And once again, you can use a spreadsheet to do it, okay? Just like what I did. You spell out you know, the uh, binary number and then you can use bin to deck and then deck to hex then you can convert everything into hexadecimal. Or you can use a calculator. You know, if you have a calculator that can do base conversion, that works too. Okay, so now we have almost everything that we need to know to get the homework assignment done. And there's one more thing, because we don't know how to use a ROM at this point. So the ROM is relatively easy to use, okay? And for this homework assignment, you just connect cell or select here to a one. So all you have to do is to find out you know, a one as a constant <coughs> and connect it to cell because cell is select. It basically means you know, is this wrong module supposed to respond to the address line? And in this homework assignment, this is the only component that you need you know, for this type of capacity. So yes, you just turn on your ROM the whole time. Okay? There's no, no need to turn it off, no need to control the, the cell input. Okay? So now we only got two things left. The address is actually the index. If you look at a ROM as a huge, gigantic, initialized array, A is whatever is between the square bracket. 
Okay, just tell me the ROM, which location do you want? Okay, so A is the index into the array, and D is the value of the element of this particular array. Okay, so the way, one way to look at this is to say D is basically the output of you know, the ROM, and the ROM is just an R-O-M, you know, look at it as an array, and then A is the index. <coughs> That's basically what it is. Is that okay? And you cannot store <coughs> it back into ROM, so you know it, it doesn't go in the opposite direction. You cannot say ROM blah 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 equals to something because you cannot store anything into ROM. It's read only. <coughs> so are we okay so far with how to play, how to use a ROM? Okay. Okay. So we have almost every single component that you need. So we, when we go back and read the homework assignment, it tells you that what you need to do, and it is kind of fun, okay, for those of you who have not really played with this type of thing, it's kind of fun. Um, because I want you to use a LED module so that your implementation will, dis will display um, certain values. It will display the digits from 0 to 9 repeatedly using uh, the seven segment display. Okay, what is a seven segment, seven segment display? The seven segment display can be found all the way at the bottom. It is under input output. And this is the seven segment display that I want you to use. Do not use hex display, okay, because that one is way too easy. So use the seven segment display, which looks like this. Okay, so let's go ahead and magnify <coughs> this just a little bit. Each pin is connected to one of the segments. Can you guys see the gray stuff, you know, well enough to, okay. So each gray segment is an, is represented by an LED, okay, it's been being backlit by an LED. So when a particular pin is connected to one, that wire or that segment will light up. So I want you know, your display to go from zero to nine and then go back to zero and repeat the whole pattern over and over again. Is that okay? Do you guys know what I want you to do? No? Sorry? Can you repeat? Okay, so I want your homework assignment um, to, so what is visible to me, what I'm gonna use for grading is whether your LED display will display zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, back to zero and repeat the whole pattern again. Okay, there's only one segment, there's only one uh, LED <coughs> display that you have to worry about. I just want that one thing to display zero to nine in a repeated fashion. Yep. So displaying that is gonna come from the output from ROM? Or that would be one way to do it. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So the only components they can use are already shown here, okay? So other than the <coughs> constants of zeros and ones, you know, this is all you can use. You can use an adder, you can use a register, you can use a ROM, you can use a second segment display, and you can use a constant, okay, the ones and the zeros as constants, um, because you will need those for the adder as well. Okay, so you, you, have, you have to use constants for the, for the adder. Yep. You have to repeat. You know, but they have to repeat. Now, the for a certain number of times. Um, no, it just repeats indefinitely, it just yeah. keep repeating, okay? But there's one one, uh, one really stringent requirement, which I'll describe here. And if you have any questions about this requirement, let me know because I want to explain that. Oh, there's one more thing. There's a button. Because you know, with a button, um, you can reset the whole thing, the counting back to zero. So I want you to use a button to do that. And you can use an OR gate also. A single two input OR gate. So the, 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 the components are all listed here. Um, the behavior, I want it to be able to repeat all the way back to zero, but with no delay between the nine and the zero. In other words, the timing has to be exactly the same. So it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. Cannot be zero, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, 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 zero, one, two, three, four. Okay? Do you guys get the idea? So the challenge, okay, I can already tell you what the challenge is. The challenge is, 
the ROM can only have an address of, of in, in measured in bits. Okay, so you can shrink it. You can shrink the number of bits for the ROM all the way down to five bits or something like that, or four bits even. Okay, so four bits will give you exactly sixteen locations, but sixteen is not ten. So how do you display the nine and then go back to the zero right away instead of repeating the nine a few times? Or repeating one of the patterns a few times? That is the question, okay? That's the challenge. So to answer that question, you have to look at all the pins of all the components and you ask, okay, which pin is going to be the first thing I need to deal with? In other words, if I put a one into this pin, it will do something that I need. Then you go back and answer the question. It was like, okay, so what else can be used to control this particular pin here? What options do we have? Okay. Are there any questions about that part? Yep. So for the the ROM, mm -hmm. so it takes. I, I guess I'm kind of confused on how it works, but it takes in values, and then from the A. A will select which location will serve as the output. Hey, hmm? Okay, let, let's let's use an example here. So we'll go ahead and use an example. So I will initialize the ROM in a particular way. So edit content. And this one only has you know like 16 locations, so it's relatively easy to deal with. So I'm gonna just give it some kind of random BS value, okay? Oh, there we go. So I'm, I'm just putting some kind of random values for uh, testing purposes. So we have a whole bunch of you know, kind of random values in the ROM. And you can always save the, the, the content of the ROM as well into a file. So in case you need the content of this ROM in another design, you can always load it back in. So we'll go ahead and you know, I'm not, I don't need it right away, so I'm going to close it. And it's still here, except it's not reflected here. And I think I, this is because I have to disconnect it first and we started simulation so let's go ahead and go to here disable reset simulation there we go and then we can re-enable the simulation there we go so we got content into the ROM now so what we want to do what I want to do is to show you what is the output from the from the D port when we change the input from the A port so the D port has uh, a whole bunch of width so I need to zoom out a little bit so I would have enough space to do it. Okay. So when you hook it up directly, it's going to complain because we got 11 bits coming out of the ROM, but we only got a one bit for the output pin. So we just have to change the output pin to also match and have 11 <coughs> bits. Okay. And the output can only represent the bits, you know, in binary, but not in hexadecimal. So this will look a little bit strange, but you know, it's a good exercise for base conversion as well. A is my address line. And in this case, when I click on the ROM, you can see that the address line only has four bits. So the input pin that will serve as the input into A only needs four bits. So I would change this to exactly four bits. And there we go. So because the ROM is already selected, so the moment I specify, you know, I want location zero, the output is now reflecting the content of location zero. Well, is that right? Is it correct? So we do the conversion once again from least significant to most significant. The least significant, you can do it one way or the other. Do you want to go from hexadecimal to binary or the other way around? Because I can do both. Binary to hexadecimal. Binary to hexadecimal. Okay, very good. So we got 0101 zero, one, zero, one as the least significant four digits, which is a five. The next one would be uh, z 1001 zero, zero, one <coughs> is corresponding to nine. 
and then we got a zero one zero left and we had one more zero as the most significant one so we got zero zero one zero which is the two okay <clears throat> we can change the location to zero uh, let's say zero one one zero which is location six okay location six has a value of zero one F in hexadecimal so once again we do the conversion from the least significant digit this time from hexadecimal to binary F is one 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 so one 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 is over here the one is a zero 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 one which accounts from zero 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 one over here and then we have a zero as a leftover which is zero 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 but out of those four only three are represented here because the output of the ROM is only 11 bit and not 12 bit so is that okay so does everybody understand how a ROM operates Okay. So the key is still to, so the first thing you need to do is to find out, you know, how to um, display, you know, zero to nine. Okay, because you have to control the individual segments of a seven segment display to display that. So, you know, if I were to, you know, okay, this is how we can test it too. So this one has uh, eight um, individual pin, and you will ask, why does it have eight individual pin when it's called a seven segment display? There's a decimal point. The dot is by itself as a signal. So when you do your homework, I don't want that dot to be turned on. Okay, I just want zero to nine. I don't want that dot to be on. Okay. All right. So how do we test this? <clears throat> we can test this using eight individual pins, which is a big hassle because we have a lot of pins. So the best way or the easiest way for me is to make a input pin that has eight individual pins or individual bits. And then we use a splitter to split it eight in eight directions. So we have eight fan out to eight and we have eight of these. So each one becomes its own individual <coughs> wire. Then we can just wire this whole thing up. Okay, so we have Depending on how you wire up between the components, <clears throat> the values that you need in order to make those specific digits will be different. But you can always do this, you know, just experiment with, okay, you know, what value it will give me which what kind of picture. Okay, so we have now a quick demonstration of you know, how the seven segment display work. So go to simulation mode, okay. So you can see, you know, how you know each individual bit is controlling a single segment. So you just have to map out which one is which one, okay? And that's assuming that you do not read the manual. Manual? What manual are you talking about? Help, library reference. Go to input output file, output input output library. Click on seven segment display, and here is your manual. It, it, it uses all these dots and those little traces to tell you which pin is corresponding to which segment of a seven segment display. So you don't even have to experiment <coughs> to find out which one is which one. It's already spelled out here. So what you need to do is to you know, basically draw it out on, the, on a piece of paper, right? You know, the segments, you know, how you want to display a one, how you want to display a two. Certain digits you can display, you know, in a variety of ways. Like six, you know, can have a tail or not have a tail. Okay, they will still be okay. Nine is the same way. Okay, um, let me see which one, which other one, you know, has options. One. Mm. Well, one is always depending on which side, right? You, know, you can have it on the left hand side, or the right hand side. So that I won't take points off, you know, because it's on the, on, on one side but not the other one. Six and nine. Hmm? Six and nine. Yeah, so six and nine are the only ones where you can, one segment is kind of optional, right? Okay, so that's up to you to design, yep. So um, the, the thing that controls the dot, is it just like the only pin over that? Or yeah, the that's the only pin. So if, uh, for the whole <coughs> reason, we don't need, we leave it unhooked? You can, unwired. no, because it's an input pin, you always have to hook it up to something. So mm -hmm. all input pins must be connected and driven in a way. Even in this case. Six, uh, it will take signal and then it will, it will display a dot. 
through, in this case, you know, without an input, you know, because the input is actually what is driving the LED, so without an input, it doesn't really, it does no, the floating doesn't bother it, it doesn't really power up the LED, but I still don't want you guys to have the, 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 the habit of leaving pins unconnected, leaving input pins unconnected. Yep. Can we put like seven bits you can put a constant of zero, yes, you can put a constant of zero to the dot. Yep. So that will satisfy the requirement of not leaving it unconnected. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So is, is that okay so far? So we got all the major pieces. So there are only two pieces left that you will also need for this homework assignment. One is you can use splitters, by the way, you can use splitters in any way you want. Okay, you can yeah. So splitters you can use. Um, we also have a button. Okay, so a button is used in this case to force the counter to go back to zero. So as it as it is counting autonomously, going to zero, one, two, three, four, five. If I press the button, it has to go back to zero right away. So, so that's what the button is for: is for resetting your counter to start from zero again. As long as the button is held, it it will still be holding the zero. Okay. And how do we use a button? This is, the, the, this is what a button looks like. To use a button, you just press it. So you go to, if, if we, when we go to uh, the simulation mode, when you press the button, as long as you hold it down, you, as long as you hold it down, the button will output a one. The moment you release it, it will output a zero. So this is a momentary switch where if you keep pressing it, it will change the state to a one. When you release it, the default state is a zero. Okay, and then you need one more, just one more component. It is going to be an OR gate. You will, you will find a use of an OR gate in this particular homework assignment. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you why you will need it, but you will need it. <laughs> so now we have all the components. Okay, we've got all the components that you need. And you just have to figure out what connects to what and also the options, because you have full control over the properties of these individual components. Okay, how many bits do you want to use for the address line of your ROM? How many locations do you need in the ROM? That's one question. Um, how many bits do you want to be the output of your ROM? In other words, how many bits is one single location of the ROM? You, have to, you can choose, okay? If you think you need 20 bits, sure, make it 20 bit wide, okay? Um, you can, let's see, what else? The constants, you can select the constants. If you need a constant of zero, make a constant of zero. If you need uh, a constant of one, make a constant of one, okay? Um, the width of the register and the width of the adder is completely up to you to decide as well, okay? Now, I, I cannot think of a reason why the width of the register and the adder and the address width would be different but if you see that there's a need for it to be different, hey, by all means, make them different. So you got all those flexibility. Any questions? So let's take a quick look at all the components, okay? And I, uh, and I will answer any questions that you might have about this homework assignment. These are all the components, you know, minus the test stuff. This is only for testing, this is only for testing, this is only for testing, <coughs> but Mm, the, the, the rest of these components are basically what you need. Yeah. Can we hook up the clock to the ROM and see how, how it goes? How would you hook up the clock to the ROM? I mean, where, where it, is. it doesn't go directly to ROM. And just like, you know, okay, so, so you, <laughs> you need a few. You, the first thing you need is a way to count up. Zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, you know, don't worry, don't even worry about okay, but I need to go back to zero at this point. Don't even worry about that. Okay. So how do you count up? Just logically speaking, you need adder, okay? So you need an adder to count up. But an adder itself is not enough for adder. What else do you need? A register, okay? You need a register because you know an adder is a combinatorial circuit, which means the output changes as soon as the input is settled down. Okay, so you, you get a sum of the two numbers, that's it. But there's no way to feed the sum back into the input without an extra component. Yep. Yeah. 
So the adder needs to be to the register so that you remember that we added that value, right? And then the adder will add the next value, but the register still remembers what it had received the, beforehand. Right? Because a register cannot change and Okay, the internal state of the register and the output of the register is, is permanently tied. Okay, in other words, the output of a register remains the same unless you change the content. Okay, but the register's content only changes when when it is first enabled. Okay, so the register has to be enabled. I do not see any other registers in here that can conflict with this register. So you know you can leave the enable always on in this case. But what is the other condition that you need? The clock goes from zero to one. Okay. Okay, so what, what thing can trigger the clock to go from zero to one out of this whole picture here? The clock. The clock, right? <laughs> the clock makes the clock tick. Wow, you know, profound, you know, <laughs> observation there, right? Okay, so that would tell you something about, you know, the hookup, you know, of the clock and the register. Okay, so now the question is how do you relate the register to the adder, right? Because it's, it's kind of like a loop thing, okay? But is this loop going to work? I mean, isn't this going to like go out of control and the whole thing just increments you know, to infinity by itself? Well, once again, the register only changes when you have a rising edge at the top. The rest of the time, anything can happen to the input, to the D port of the register, nothing happens to the register because there's, there's a lack of a rising edge of the clock. Okay? What do we do with the output of the register? It is going to be zero, one, two, three, four, blah, 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 blah. What do we do with that? What do we store in ROM, by the way? The actual well, I want the output, I want the display to display zero to nine, right? So who's gonna remember those individual bits to those individual wires? The ROM is gonna remember that, okay? So that's your music box. Except your music box is not playing notes. It is playing the digital display. <coughs> is that okay? And it's zero to nine, so we don't actually need to hexadecimal. We don't even deal with hexadecimal. It's, it's just zero to nine, okay? But the, but, the, but the problem is, if I made it hexadecimal, zero to F, it, it's actually an easier homework assignment. But if I go from zero to nine, it actually makes it harder. Because once it gets to nine, it has to go back to zero. How do you make it go back to zero? There's one pin of the register that can do that. I'm not gonna tell you which one, but there's one pin that can do it. So now the question is, how do I control that pin so that you know, at a certain time, when it needs to be, it will go back to zero? So that is something for you guys to think about, okay? <laughs> That's the only part that is kind of kind of ickish, kind of, ah, okay, how do we do that, okay? And then there's also the question of the OR gate, you know, why do we need that OR gate in here? Because there are two ways to reset the counter. One is automatically, once you get to nine, if the next one is a zero, the second one is the push button. You press the button, you're supposed to restart from zero. <clears throat> So the OR gate gives you the ability to take in two inputs and say, okay, we got two ways to reset this thing, you know, either one will do it, okay? So I'm leaving some blanks in the description of what you need to do because I think you guys can figure it out, especially with the whole week, okay? It's part of the fun of doing this sort of thing too. I do this all the time. In my previous job, you know, as a um, embedded system engineer, you know, I do mostly the software part, but the guys who do the hardware part basically do this every single time they come up with a new project. So they use the same, they use the same processor, the same RAM chips, the same flash ROM chips, the same this and that and whatnot, okay? And then just, you know, kind of put different things into the box, shake it a few times, oh, new product, wow. <laughs> Oh, okay, this is not new enough. Let's let's throw in like two or three more chips. Shake it again. Wow. Revolutionary new product. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's basically what uh, what we did to come up with some of the new products. So any questions about this? Questions? 
questions? Yep. Uh, so, <coughs> I guess for the, uh, I guess I'm just confused on the interaction between the register and the adder. Okay, so there's, there's definitely some interaction between the register and the adder. So the idea is, you know, I want the um, display to change only on every single rising clock edge. Okay, so that is gonna give, that's gonna give you some clues right there, okay? So how do you make it happen with the adder and the register? Okay, so when you, when you look at the adder, okay, <clears throat> the function of an adder is not really exactly, you know, exciting, because what an adder does is just adding, okay? <clears throat> And you can specify what goes into the carry in. Okay, now in your design, you're not going to use input pins at all. Okay, so you're going to use either constants or use you know the clock line or use a button. Okay, there should be no input pins whatsoever in your design. But the the adder doesn't just do doesn't do anything too exciting. All it does is adding. Okay, that's all it does. And we can test what an adder does. Just go like, well, okay, this is the this is one of the inputs. And I'll, I'll leave this one as a zero, and I'll turn this one into a one. And now we can see that the output is one more than the top of the input, right? The top input. But the problem is, I don't need it to just do the one single calculation, but I need that to go back into the input somehow. In other words, this output of the adder has to go back in some way into the input so that you know, the next time, okay, when something happens, I will be using the new number as the input, and then we have a new number coming out of it as the output. That is what the register is going to be used for. Because the, the register, it, it serves as a buffer, because the register doesn't change until there's a rising edge. But before the rising edge, anything can happen to the D port, A, you know, it doesn't pay attention at all. So that's going to be how the register is going to be useful in this design. So one way to look at this particular design is to look at every single pin of a register, and then you ask the question, how am I going to use this pin? What does it do mechanically when you look up the reference of the, of the register? What does this pin do mechanically? And then the second, second question then is, how does it fit into this particular project? Okay, Of all the things that we need to do, why, what, is, what is this pin, how is this pin related to what I need to do? So it's a two-stage question. First stage is to fully understand what it does mechanically by itself. And then the second one is to connect it to the context of this homework assignment. Is that okay? Cool. Any other questions about these components? I can describe the individual compartment or components. I just don't want to give you the full idea of how to connect between the components. Yep. Are we allowed to use more components? Are we allowed to use more? Like, because the current design that I have, if I would need an AND gate, or am I allowed to have an AND gate integrated in there as well? You do not need an AND gate. The OR gate would be, which should be able to do what we need to do. So I guess if we added an AND gate or any additional components, that would be that would that would maybe not fit the requirement of the homework. Okay. But splitters, so we can add any number of splitters. You can use any number of split splitters. You can split any way you want. And you can use any constants also. Okay. Yep. The uh, values inside the wall, we manually any values we want. You have to manually enter those values. So you get to determine those values. I almost said something about, oh, you know what, you can look up that and it's already there. But I didn't, I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gated output. <coughs> but we have seen it already. You, you, you have seen it in a previous lecture already. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Which video at what time in the video, right? <laughs> <laughs> Now we have seen it already. It's just that I, it, it was it was a very brief and vague description of that thing. <laughs> All right. So this is a new homework assignment. All right. So <clears throat> so it does fit into what we are going to talk about in this class soon because um, after this homework assignment. We are going to, okay, there are a lot of gray stuff here that you don't see because they, they really do not apply. Although some of these can be quite interesting, like a hardware multiplier and a hardware divider. Using the gates and the subtractor and the adder, you know, that's, actually, that's actually possible. <coughs> um, yeah, so we're going to talk about the processor, you know, the architecture of the processor. And then after that, you know, we'll start to um, you know, actually make use of the processor. So the first thing we'll do is we'll understand how to break a C program down to the components so that we can actually use the instructions of the processor to implement the C program. Okay? So this is a, kind of like a really important transition of this class because we are kind of going, um, moving away from the gates, from the flip-flops and the, all the hardware-oriented topics, and we are moving into the software topic. By using the opcodes, the mnemonics, you know, we are looking at you know, how to implement loops, how to implement subroutines, how to implement conditional statements, that sort of thing. So we are slowly, you know, moving into that direction and you know, going, kind of departing the, the hardware description step and moving into the software step. <clears throat> okay, are there any questions about um, the homework? Or anything about the story? Did you guys read the other stuff? You know, the uh, the story of registers. Okay. So we'll, I'll let you guys do the homework, you know, first, and then we'll go back and talk about the, the registers. Um, the bottom line is registers are very fast, and they can keep up with the ALU operation because they're on the same chip. Memory, on the other hand, is expensive. <coughs> to it's, 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 it takes up a lot of time. <coughs> but you can store a lot of stuff in memory. Okay, do you guys remember the analogy? Um, if I have a, you know, if, I'm the, if I am the ALU inside the processor, I can only do computations, right? You know, you give me two numbers to add, I can give you the sum really fast, okay? That's the job of an ALU. But I cannot remember anything. Well, if I cannot remember anything, then it's not useful at all because, you know, then I, I the moment you give me new numbers to process, I immediately forget the old numbers. Okay, and there's no place for me to write down the old numbers, you know, the, the, the result of the previous calculation. So these paper, okay, is representing registers. So from the ALU's perspective, the arithmetic logic unit perspective, this is all, this, all I, can, I can write down stuff here, okay? You know, the answers to the previous addition, I write it down here. Um, the, another subtraction, I would write it down over here, and so on and so forth. So when somebody says, oh, I need to use the sum and add it to the other, the, the difference, I, I got these two sheets already, okay? So I can keep track of some calculations. Is that okay? But I only got so many pieces of paper as registers, okay? Um, in the case of an Intel processor, the older Intel processors only had eight pieces of paper that the ALU really has access to. The newer processors, I think they have up to maybe 16 or so. RISC processors typically have 32 or more of these you know, little pieces of paper. So they're really handy because when I have all, more of these you know, little pieces of paper, I don't need to go outside <coughs> the classroom to store something because I have you know, more of these little pieces of paper. But eventually, I will run out, okay? <clears throat> when was the last time you wrote a program that only need like eight variables? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm including pointers and stuff like that too. <laughs> okay, well that kind of points out you know, why you know, we cannot put everything into registers. So what, what, what happens when you run out of registers? You have to use memory, okay? You have to use RAM, okay? The RAM is expensive to use because it takes a lot of time to set it up, to access it, and stuff like that. So we would rather not use RAM if we can avoid it. Um, so that means you know any architecture that has more registers are more efficient. Okay, 
and RISC processors tend to have more registers than CISC processors. What is RISC again? R I S C. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. Computer. And then CISC is complex instruction set computer. Okay. So typically, CISC processors tend to have fewer registers, and RISC processors tend to have more registers. Why do you think that is the case? Yeah, go ahead. That, but that's fine, uh, as long so as it's cost related. Is the register, is it the cache? No. Registers are even faster than the cache. Cache is kind of like a, it's a buffer between memory and the rest of the processor. So it's basically, you know, okay. So the, the function of cache is kind of like this. Um, one of you, you know, is designated as the as the gopher. So whenever I need something from the library, you are the one you're running out to the library to retrieve that you know, stuff for me. Okay. So one day you say, ah, this is enough. Okay, I got enough physical exercise. Um, so what you so what you end up doing is to say, okay, I notice a pattern. Tech tends to look up these books on these pages a lot. Okay. So what you did is to say, well, he cannot really tell the difference between a copy of the book versus the book itself. So because I really know that you know, he needs a lot of those particular pages, so you secretly make, make phone copies of those books that you know that I need to access frequently, and you put it into a backpack. Okay. So next time I say, hey, you know, uh, I need you know, page you know, 2,260 of this particular book, you go outside of the door, it's still outside of the door, outside of the processor, right? But then you didn't go all the way to the library. You just, you know, you just looked at your backpack, go to a, go a book and go like, did I have that cop a copy of that book? Yes. Then you immediately come back into the room and go like, wow, back so soon? Yep, I got the page. <clears throat> That's cache. So cache is based on you know, <laughs> observation of what content I tend to use more in RAM and then have a quote unquote local copy of that. So they don't have to go all the way to the library. But it actually works kind of more, much more complex than this. This is a kind of way oversimplified version of how the cache works. Because you, know, you only have so much capacity in the cache. So a cache is a lot bigger than all the registers added together. Because when you look at 32 registers, each one is 64 bits, it's only giving you what, hundreds of bytes. But when you look at cache, they're talking about megabytes at least, right? So that's a lot more, which basically means if I if these are the registers, cache is kind of like you know a backpack of books. Okay, that's kind of the the, the, the magnitude of you know of, of cache. It is still slower to access because you know as a processor, these things are at my fingertip. I don't have to ask anyone to go these, get these pages. It is accessible directly inside the processor from the ALU's perspective. But when it's coming to coming to cache, I'm still asking the person, okay, you know, the person who's usually going to the library, I'm still asking that person to go, okay, can you look up this book and come back and with page you know, 269 of that book? I still have to go through all that stuff. It's just that that person doesn't have to go all the way to the library, just have to go out of the door, look up in the backpack, go like, ah, I got a local copy, come back in. So it is still slower, it is still quite a bit slower compared to registers. Registers are by far the fastest way to store and to retrieve information inside the process. But the problem is there are only so many registers that you can use. So why, why when I look at, I guess, uh, CPU specifications, they always talk about uh, the clock speed and the cache. That's usually the most. The clock speed is um, basically the main clock, okay? Which basically is kind of the clock signal that we are looking at. So the higher the clock, it means you know, the, the, the faster you can do calculations inside the processor. Okay? <coughs> but it doesn't really help unless you can get information into the processor to process and get the processed information back outside to store. So that's why you know, memory access speed is also critical to, the, to this overall performance of a computer. And then cache you know, is also important because if a program has locality, which means you know, there are certain locations in memory that it tends to use over and over and over again, cache is a lot faster than memory, even though it's not as fast as register. So if you can keep most of the instructions and most of the data that you need to process in cache, then your program will execute far much faster than going all the way to memory. 
So that's why you know the clock speed is important. But until you you, you you solve the problem of your memory bottleneck, the internal processing speed is totally pointless. How many cores you have is totally pointless. Because let's say we have one person who's a very slow walker to the library. <clears throat> And then we have 16 ALUs inside the processor, or 16 cores inside the processor. Those 16 cores are all going at high speed doing all the calculations, and then they all sit around and just wait for that person to come back with more pages as either instructions or data to process. So that, that's not going to be very useful. <coughs> Is that OK? Now we have, well, we're running out of time. I was just about to explain you know, how DDR fits into this whole picture. Okay, very quick analogy, okay? Because I know you guys want to do, get the homework assignment done, right? <clears throat> so very quick analogy. Without DDR, every single time you go to the library, you're only reading a page. You come back, and then I will tell you, oh, okay, I think the next page, it is you know, the same book, just increment the page count by one, but I have to give you the page number and then you have to go again, okay? That is not very efficient because every, every single page that I need to access from the library, I have to spell out the call number, the page number, and so on, and then you have to go out and go get that page, come back with only one single page, and then the next one is going to be most likely the next page, but then you have to go again. Is that okay? DDR is basically saying, Okay, tech, I know that most of the time when you specify a page, you really need to use you know, the following 32 pages too. So when I go to the library, guess what? I'm gonna copy 32 pages instead of one. I'll give you the one that you need, but I'm keeping those 30 other one other pages in my backpack as cash. So the next time that I say, I'm done with this page, I'm ready for the next page, you go like, I got it in my backpack already. That's DDR. That's what DDR does in first low memory access. Because when you go to the library, you don't even need to ask me, oh, do you need that page too? Or do you need that page too? You just automatically grab 64 pages. That saves you a lot of trips. So now I'm pretty sure right now you guys are all here having that little person in your mind. You're going in and out of the classroom, <laughs> to the library, panting and you know, sweating and yeah, yeah, that's a that's about that's a good picture to have. Because that's basically what is happening. Okay, you know, because that's kind of representing, you know, how um, data moves, you know, inside a computer system. Right. So the class is over. I'm going to uh, stop the lecture at this point. You can go with me to the lab to start with your homework assignments, and I think some of you probably can get it done today. So if you have any questions, you know, during the lab time, just let me know, and I'll try to answer those questions.